Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and today I'm going to try, in a sense, to make up for all those years when I very much wanted to, but somehow never did, ask my good friend Joe Baum to join me here to talk about the great restaurants he had created during his celebrated career as America's premier restaurateur, to talk about food itself and about Joe's unique ability always to use it to make life better and brighter for the fortunate ones who came his way. To be honest, I always knew that the Baum presence here would have been big box office for the open mind. But I also realized how unique, how personalized, and how largely indecipherable to everyone else our own shorthand mode of conversation must have become over the years. And so I kept putting off my invitation to Joe until, of course, it was too late. And the world of good food, good drink, good taste could only mourn both Joe's genius and his passing. But then 9-11 occurred, and along with the thousands of other innocent lives cruelly wiped out that September morning by fanatical terrorists, we heard more and more about Joe Baum's early creation, the incomparable Windows on the World restaurant at the very top of the World Trade Center, where scores of food preparers and waiters and busboys and dishwashers and other restaurant workers lost their lives, leaving scores of destitute families behind. So from Windows on the World, we went to Windows of Hope, thanks to a considerable extent to another genius in the restaurant world, one I vowed not to let get away from the open mind this time. Tom Valenti owns and is the executive chef of West, the outstanding new restaurant that has become the culinary joy of the West Side in Manhattan. I know, I live there. But it isn't his wonderful dishes alone or even the philosophy of food and drink that informs his work as a chef and restaurateur that make my guests so interesting and impressive. It's the time he spent since 9-11 creating and building and supporting Windows of Hope, a fund, as New York Magazine reported recently, he and others in the food industry established to aid the families of food service workers, mostly from Windows on the World killed in the World Trade Center. Indeed, the story in New York, in explaining his own connection to the victims and their survivors, quotes my guest as saying, these are the people who get us through our days. They always showed up for work. They were never late. And once a year, they would bring their families around for Christmas. Those are the people out there now, Valenti adds, holding his voice in check. Then tears well up, before he turns his head to discreetly wipe his eyes. Obviously, Windows of Hope holds much meaning for my guest, and I guess that's where I'd like to begin today, Mr. Valenti. What is that meaning? Well, you know, we have a tendency to spend many hours in our restaurants, and as a result, the time that we spend with our employees and our workmates is often much longer than we spend with our real families. So, these people were, in a sense, then equivalent to your family. Extended family, indeed. And what's happening with uh, the fund? Where well, is it now? What is it doing? Well, the fund is currently being held by J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, we have uh, partnered with the Community Service Society of New York, which is a social services that have been around for about 155 years. Um, they're also recipients of the New York Times Neediest Fund. 
So we're taking their lead, our, their, our lead from them in terms of how to structure the fund for immediate, mid, and long-term needs. And um, we're doing distributions. We've made a commitment to five years of health insurance for the entire group. Um, in the group, there's represented about 250 people plus. And many of them are children. We have uh, a number of children, uh, somewhere in the 160 people range. But it's, it's still, even though time has gone by, still to determine exactly how many um, there were families here, families overseas as well. It's not an easy process, is it, to uh, take in money and know how to give it out in a constructive uh, manner? Well, it's, you know, without being too paternalistic or too dictatorial, um, it is difficult. It is difficult, and especially in a circumstance like this that none of us have really ever experienced before. Um, we want to be very mindful that there are a number of issues. There are many different levels of need within our group. And we also want to be thorough in our analysis of where they're getting money from other sources. Will we, in fact, impede their ability to get money from other sources if we give to them too much too soon, for example? Is that still a consideration? It is a consideration. I think that uh, for our group particularly, I think that uh, the federal grants, which um, I've been boning up on, you know, to t make a to make a determination whether they're going to be recipients of that or not. Uh, it has a lot of impact on how and when we distribute funds. This then is a matter of uh, the the division of opinion uh, about the use of this money, uh, whether it is it goes to in large part to the people who were there and lost their lives, the civilians, the people who were there almost incidentally, or the firemen and the policemen and the Port Authority people, the, the heroes mm -hmm. who helped rescue those who were right. rescued. Well, you know, when, when we started structuring the fund, we were particularly mindful of the food and beverage industry people, uh, many of whom do not have life insurance, 401k, pension plan type of structure. Um, when we started the fund, we really wanted to avail it to anyone. I think back at that time, there were a number of people, I think we all were in a circumstance where we wanted to help, but we didn't know quite what to do. You know, we couldn't go to Ground Zero and dig. There were a number of volunteers already down there feeding. And, you know, there were lines around the block of the blood banks. And we really wanted to have this opportunity, being the night of October 11th when this was kicked off, um, a real opportunity for anyone who chose to go out to dinner that night that they were, that they were participating and donating. Um, we had some discussions early on about doing you know, a grand $500 a plate dinner, and it really was not in the spirit of the fund because we felt that if someone wanted to come in off the street and have a beer and a burger, that they should be allowed to do that. And if it were a $5 tab or a $10 tab or a $1,000 tab, it still was in the spirits of this, you know, grassroots type of gone global uh, affair. Now you've started something. Do you see an end to it? Do you see a uh, point down the road? where you will not be as occupied as you are now so much with the fund? Yeah, I think that uh, I have no misgivings about my abilities. Um, I'm a pretty good chef and I'm a good fly fisherman. Um, this is somewhat new to me. I know that uh, because of its circumstance, um, it probably won't be the type of fund that continues to solicit donations. Um, I really don't want to get into too much of a long-standing thing because it, 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 it requires a lot more maintenance and administrative costs as a result. Now, what is this going to do in terms of your own restaurant, in terms of the restaurants of the colleagues who joined with you 
in this work in terms of um, making certain that employees in the restaurant industry, in the food industry, are protected better than they obviously had been. Well, without again, without um, soliciting funds or creating something aside from what our original mission statement was, is I think that we have an opportunity with Windows of Hope now that we have a mechanism in place. Um, if, God forbid, there is another circumstance or a hurricane or a flood or a tornado, um, hopefully what Windows of Hope Fund will be able to do is to kick back into gear if, uh, if it's required. And in taking care of uh, industry workers without a catastrophe? You know, that, that becomes something that is decidedly different, perhaps. I know. Um, you know, we had set this up for one reason and one reason only, which was for emergency care, health care, and scholarships for the families of the victims. Um, we've talked about it to some extent, um, and we're not, we're not really sure that that's what we intend on doing. Is that because we are the bosses of the industry? We being David Emile, who was uh, owners of Window on the World, Michael Lamonico, who was the executive chef of Windows on the World, and Waldi Malouf, who is the chef at Beacon Restaurant, Beacon being the sister restaurant to Windows on the World. Um, you know, we, we have a responsibility and we, we take it very, very seriously. You know, I talked about Joe Baum uh, before, regretting that he had never sat where right, you're right. sitting now. Uh, you say you do good restaurants, and you do, and West is great, and you're a great fly fisherman. <laughs> uh, how do you compare if you do, or how do you contrast if you do, the more philosophical, no, I don't mean more, the philosophical orientation that Joe Baum seemed to have about food. Do you, do you fit into that? Uh, Joe could talk and talk and talk and talk about uh, good food, good drink, good atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. And you? Well, Joe Baum was, as, as we both know, quite a special fellow, and he certainly stood head and shoulders tenfold above me. Um, I think that all of us within this culinary uh, group, this whole, uh, this whole extended family, in one way or another learned from him. Uh, he, was, he was quite a guy. And as far as philosophizing about food and drink, are we ever going to turn to Joe Valenti and uh, hear him rhapsodize about his purpose? Indeed, let me ask you, you say you're a great or very good fly fisherman, and I read in New York Magazine that you are indeed, and it's something you love. And I bet you could go on at great length describing the beauties of fly fishing. Mm -hmm. What about the beauties of uh, food, well, the restaurants? Beauties. I mean, you know, it, it is so founded in family for what me. What do you mean? Well, I, th I think that from where my cooking interests first started was at a very young age, um, at my grandmother's knee. And uh, she used to have a stool next to the stove that I would watch her perform her daily maneuvers. Uh, my grandfather's garden was exemplary. His winemaking was left a little bit to be desired, but that's another story for another time. Um, it's really about the exchange. It's about the exchange of, uh, of, of, of giving. I mean, I think that if a style were to be assessed on what I do, um, I think it's I think it's distinctly more homier than it is intellectual. You said that, so I read somewhere that you, you, you said that, and I wanted to ask you what you meant by that. I think that the understanding of one's taste memory has a lot to do with it. I think that, I'll give you an example. I 
love a hot fudge sundae. So do I. Right. But you can eat them. I can't. Now, there might be someone out there who could make a very good tarragon flavored ice cream. And it might be fantastic. I don't have an association with those flavors. I do have memory of hot fudge sundaes. And I think that for me in my cooking, there's a through line with something that has a certain amount of familiarity. But in reading about West, I read about all kinds of people, high and low, who come to the restaurant to enjoy it. Now, this means that they must have different uh, tribal memories. <laughs> Certainly. I would think so, but I think that, you know, along with that taste memory, but there's also a practical application of combinations and textures and textural contrasts, things like that. You know, it's, it's not all about remembering your mother's spaghetti sauce or your mother's meatloaf or your mother's paprikash, whatever the case may be, but I think that within terms of what was traditional or classical cooking and where we've gone from there in terms of, you know, fabulous ethnic inclusions and cross-cultural type of cooking, I think there's something about that more classically ensconced. Are you going to stay at that place? I don't mean the location of West. I mean stay at that place intellectually, if I may ask. I think I have for quite some time. I don't see a change. I think that you know, age and dietary considerations certainly play into it what do you as mean? much as anything. Your I, age? I think my age, I think that my, the way I cook for myself, the way I, my wife cooks for me, I think in terms of what makes me feel good. I mean, there were, you know, some years ago, not too many years ago, when um, I could work until 11 o'clock and then go out until 3 in the morning with my my ne'er-do-well chef friends and eat and drink and pop up the next morning and have a go at the kitchen again. And I can't do that anymore. Um, and I think that that has some influence and impact on how I cook. So that West reflects a kind of hominess? To some extent, it certainly does. I mean, we, you know, we, we put a little show in there from time to time. Yes, indeed. You know, you have to. It's theater. Um, but I think at the base, at the base of it, I think that it's really just straight up cooking. So interesting you say, it's theater, because that's what Joe said so many times to me. It's, it's theater. And I never had the opportunity to say, what do you mean, Joe? Yeah. What do you mean, Joe? It's, uh, it's, it's like so many other forms of entertainment. I think that um, people want to be comfortable. They want to be wowed. They want to be satisfied. Um, and I think that, you know, again, with Joe Baum, I think he was the master of putting on the performance. I think it, he was just so attentive to so many details. Um, that's what made him, you know, among the best. You're, you also are attentive to those details. And obviously, right now, well, uh, this profile of you in New York Magazine is so interesting because it relates you to 9-11, not just in terms of the fund, the foundation, not just in terms of the way you've devoted yourself to taking care of the survivors in the restaurant business, uh, but uh, the degree to which West itself reflects Oh, an interest in, uh, for the rest of us, your customers, those who come to West, to have something homey. Mm -hmm. uh, now, that can't last, can it? And what happens to West when that cultural phenomenon is dissipated? Well, I, I, have, I have faith in, in the product. Um, I think that you know, my partner, Godfrey Palestina, and I have kind of a kindred spirit in terms of cooking style and, more importantly, probably eating style. Um, I think that there is always 
inherent in the style, there's always been a through line for me. I think that my cooking style has not wavered much for, for many years now. Um, when we opened, we being Allison Price and I, opened a restaurant called Allison on Dominic Street in 1989, um, we were coming off the mid to late 80s style of cooking, which was very popular and, and quite frankly very good, of a lot of things like quickly grilled pieards of chicken and fish that were, you know, draped over salads with, with goat cheese and things like that. And at that point, I really wanted to find a different direction. I was looking more for a soul satisfaction, and it really went into, back into real traditional technique. Things like braising, for example, which are low, long cooking processes that really, you know, they, they yank as much flavor out of whatever you're cooking as, uh, as you, about as you're going to get. So I think that getting back to the question of, of, of what happens with West, um, hopefully people will always respond to that style. It became so extraordinarily popular so soon, of course, before September 11th that you obviously are responding to a, uh, a visceral need, and maybe that's what you mean by saying you don't want to intellectualize yeah, yeah. Uh, about these things. And I, I must say that I just got a message surreptitiously that I obviously so identify you with Joe Baum that I called you Joe instead of Tom, and you're very gracious not to say, hey. I will, I will, that, that's a compliment I'll take any day. What are, the, uh, what are the differences in cultures? I mean, you, you worked in France. What are the differences between uh, the French and the Americans as they reflect their history, their culture, their upbringing? Well, I, I think that, you know, in terms of French technique and tradition, um, there are arguably restaurants as good as there are in Paris here in New York. Um, I think that as a nation, France had adopted long, long, long before America uh, a distinct style of cooking, and those roots could be traced back to Italy. Um, prior, but what's wonderful about New York and its cooking is that we have these ethnic influences. Um, you know, and it, we, my wife and I go out to eat and we quite often will seek out an ethnic restaurant just because it's, it's different and interesting. Um, training in France has always been top priority. And I think that as Americans, we're a little bit behind the curve as far as training goes. I mean, these kids in France start when they're young, 13, 14 years old. And it's a very stringent, very strict training process in the kitchen. That's not really possible for us, is it? It's not. And I think that, you know, what gives French restaurants an advantage in terms of what style of food they do and what ingredients they use and, and truly how much they can charge is that, you know, France has a government funded apprentice program. I didn't know that. Consequently, what happens is, for example, when I worked at Guy Savoie in Paris many years ago, many years ago, um, the restaurant did about 50 dinners a night or 55 dinners, but we had 13 or 14 or 15 cooks in the kitchen. You know, and there were only a handful that were actually being paid. And the balance of the workforce was funded by the government. So what that means to us as chefs in a, in a practical world is the ratio of employees, if we were to try to do it here in America, um, the payroll would far outweigh what you could actually create for a profit based on those numbers of 13 or 14 cooks versus the 55 dinners that you could do. You know, at West, for example, we have eight people in the kitchen to do 300 dinners. 
Um, so there's quite a difference there. And you're suggesting, you're agreeing that that's not likely to change in this country. I don't think anytime soon. I think that we certainly have put our own stamp on things. I think that in the last 20 years, the, the culinary world has, has changed dramatically in America, obviously for the better. Um, the number of great restaurants and great chefs is, is astounding. Where, where do you look for the best food? Um, in two minutes, so we can't stick you too long food, with that. The best food, I, I go to my friend's restaurants where I know I'll always get the best food. Um, sourcing out the best food for the use of the restaurant, um, I have different sources. I try to support local farmers as much as I can, along with a great number of chefs here in New York. But uh, the top few, Mario Batali at Babo, Terrence Brennan at Picholine, Alfred Portali, Gotham Bar and Grill, um, and I could go on, Charlie Palmer at Oriole. The list is, is, is too expansive, as is the talent. If I asked you about Chicago, San Francisco, L.A., Denver, would you be able to come up with substantial lists? You too? betcha. Substantial, perhaps not, but a few, a few of the places that would allow, you know, time time allotments when uh, when traveling. So when I know that my time is limited, my time is almost up. I should go and eat in France, in the U.S., in Italy. Where? Wherever, wherever, ever. I think that every every continent, nation, and culture has uh, has its standouts. Obviously, the answer is I'm going to come to West and Joe Valenti. See, there I did it again. Tom Valenti, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a real thank pleasure. Thank you, Richard. And um, I'm not going to put in a plug for West other than what I've done, but doggone it, you have mastered it as Joe Baum did, and uh, I appreciate that as his old friend. Thanks. Thank you so much. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. And if you would like a transcript of today's program, please send $4 in check or money order to the Open Mind P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as an old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.